All right. Bismillah wa alhamdulillah wa salawat wa salam ala rasulullah wa alihi wa sahbihi wa min wala. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh to your excellent brothers and sisters, colleagues, members of the ISIP movement and all affiliated uh, people from all over the world. It's such an honor to have you all with us. Honestly, we're so blessed by the grace of Allah Azza wa Jal that he allows us to unite twice a month to listen to some of the leading scholars and practitioners in the field of Islamic psychology and Muslim mental health, to learn from them, to learn from each other, uh, from this collective learning platform, which is ISIP. First and foremost, I want to send all my salams, my thoughts, my dua, our praise actually to all of our uh, brothers and sisters in Morocco and Algeria who have been suffering right now due to the earthquakes, the devastating earthquakes. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy for all of those who have lost any loved ones or lost, you know, family members or colleagues or, you know, friends. Uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant uh, Jannat al firdaus to all those who have passed away due to this devastating earthquakes. One of my teachers told me that people who pass away due to natural disasters like earthquakes they get jannah directly they go to jannah directly one of my teachers said that you know like so alhamdulillah uh, that we inshallah make dua uh, that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive everybody for their shortcomings and sins and that grant all of us jannah and fardas uh, and also uh, that these people that are going through struggles right now that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give them sabr and sakina in their heart and peace uh, during this hard time and that inshallah they will be re reunited with their loved ones and in, in jannah inshallah we'll make dua for that inshallah uh, we will in isip international students of islamic psychology organize some efforts and how we can support our brothers and sisters who are working in the field now to give first help respond in morocco particularly i know that it affected algeria as well by the way there is a lot of great uh, initiatives going on, and there are people that are offering, you know, psychosocial, spiritual support for those who have survived this uh, devastating earthquakes. Uh, there is a lot of initiatives, both from international Muslim aid organizations, Islam, international aid organization generally. We will try to collect all resources and share in all of our groups in social media, WhatsApp, uh, inshallah, even in other social media. So feel, please stay tuned. Uh, also, uh, we're establishing a task force within ISIP, uh, which is a crisis support task force, where we're trying to see how we as, you know, both students of Islamic psychology and knowledge, but also as mental health professionals and practitioners can help with our, you know, competencies and knowledge when it comes to psychosocial support. So more information about that. If you guys are interested to join these efforts, we will share resources in the Zoom chat. For instance, if you guys want to join the task force for crisis support group, we have some of the leading uh, psychiatrists and psychologists who have worked in you know, war-torn areas and also with natural disasters that are, are part of these groups, inshallah. So these are some of our you know, contributions. And of course, prayers and dua are the best contributions as well. So please keep all of our beloved brothers and sisters in Morocco and Algeria in your precious du'as, dear brothers and sisters. I had the honor to visit Morocco in February. What a beautiful country with beautiful people. And, and we know that a lot of our brothers and sisters in Turkey also experienced the same earthquakes uh, you know, last year. So we're trying to also disseminate the knowledge from Turkey and how they handled the aftermath of the earthquakes. There was a lot of great initiatives there. And we have a Turkish chapter in ISIP, ISIP Turkey. And inshallah, we're trying to disseminate that knowledge to our Moroccan brothers and sisters as well, inshallah. When we unite as an Ummah, brothers and sisters, this is the beauty of digitalization. We're allowed to now to easily connect through Zoom, WhatsApp, all over the world, right? ISIP is a movement that was established through digitalization during the pandemic, right? We connected with one another, one another right? So this allows us to really be an Ummah, both uh, uh, emotionally, physically, and also spiritually. So inshallah, we will uh, share resources and all of your efforts, all of your supports, dear colleagues, dear brothers and sisters, dear, dear mental health practitioners is beneficial. So if you're a mental health practitioner, join the group, tell us that you're a mental health practitioner, you want to be able to help, inshallah. And we will find a way, inshallah, together, uh, by the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All right, today we are here uh, to uh, listen to a lecture again. Uh, and uh, the lecture will be about Islamic psychology, a golden thread through identity, presence, and interventions, together with Dr. Layla Asamarai from the United States of America. Please forgive me, Dr. Layla, if I pronounced your uh, last name wrong, by the way. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. 
Um, today's agenda will be to recite Surat al Fatiha, and then we will do uh, welcoming guidelines. Uh, we will give a certificate of appreciation to our excellent Ustada, Dr. Leila. Uh, and then we will listen to Dr. Leila uh, for about 50, 60 minutes. And then we want Q&As. Feel free to write all your questions in the Zoom chat and we will address them at the end of the session. And then we will do some closing duas. Um, so let's start by reciting Surah Al-Fatiha. And let's also recite it for all of our brothers and sisters in Morocco as well, inshallah, and Algeria. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Maliki madin. Iyaka na'abudu wa iyaka nasta'in. Ahdana sirat al-mustaghim. Sirat al-ladina alamta alayhim. Ghayr al-ma'adubi alayhim. Wala al-ma'adhiin. Amin. Sallallahu alayhi wa Alhamdulillah. All right, dear brothers and sisters. Uh, Briefly about the Zoom etiquette. It's nothing new, you know, you guys know already. Um, just keep your microphone muted at all times. This is because we want to uh, give you guys the best lecture as possible, you know. No recordings or screenshots are allowed. We will share the recording of the lecture within a couple of days. Honestly, we had some issues with our YouTube channel. So the previous lecture we did with Ustad Abdullah Maynard is not uploaded yet. Some of you have requested that from us. So inshallah, as soon as possible, both the previous lecture and this lecture with Dr. Leila will be uploaded in ISAP's YouTube channel. And feel free to subscribe to our YouTube channel. We will send the link to the channel in the Zoom chat. Uh, any questions, feel free to add them to the Zoom chat and we will address them to Dr. Leila at the end of the session. If you need any live transcriptions, please press the more button in the Zoom application in the uh, lower bottom of the app and then request for it and then you can get access to it. Inshallah. A little bit about IESIP's mission statement, dear brothers and sisters. Uh, we as IESIP, the International Students of Islamic Psychology, we try to be an inclusive space designed to connect people with diverse backgrounds interested in the field of Islamic psychology. We have about 20,000 members now from over 90 countries and nationalities, which is amazing. We have over 30 local and regional chapters all over the world. If you guys want to join the movement, we will add also how you guys can join, inshallah. If you want to be part of a local chapters, or if you want to establish a local chapter in your country where we do not have any local chapter, feel free to reach out. We will be honored to support you with that. Our aim is also to disseminate knowledge, share resources, and discuss best practices in a free and accessible manner. So everything we do within ISIP is free of charge because what we want everybody, no matter which social, economic, or background you have, to benefit from the sacred knowledge of Islamic psychology. We also want to be a platform to enable further development of people's personal and professional interests, studies and understanding of Islamic psychology within their communities and countries of origin. I also want to thank my colleagues today, uh, Sister Kalthar, Sister Nadira, Sister Fatima, Sister Nadia for helping out. Uh, and we're honored to be at your service, brothers and sisters. Ways to contribute and to participate within ISIP movement, subscribe to our ISIP YouTube channel, join our Islamic psychology WhatsApp groups for discussions and resource sharing. The link will be shared in the Zoom chat. Also the task force for crisis support group, by the way. And if you want to become a member of ISIP, free of charge, of course, visit our website at www.isip.foundation, where you can get access to our digital library with over thousand resources within the field of Islamic psychology and Muslim mental health, free of charge. So these are some ways, share all of our resources, and benefit from this sohba, this digital sohba and companionship that we're trying to establish, inshallah. And as I mentioned, if you want to establish a chapter, join other chapters, uh, con contact us. Our details will be in the Zoom chat or on our website. All right, let's go to the highlight of our uh, you know, session today, dear brothers and sisters. Allow me to introduce Dr. Leila Asamarai. Dr. Leila is a licensed psychologist and practice owner residing in Minnesota, U.S. She earned uh, her doctorate in 2006, and since that time has worked in a variety of placements, including working with inner city populations, survivors of torture, outpatient settings, and heading a psychology unit in Dubai, the United Arab Emirates. In addition to completing her doctoral dissertation on premarital relig religiosity and subsequent marital satisfaction, she authored a chapter entitled Utilization of Islamic Principles in Mar Marital Counseling in 2016. Dr. Laila is an EMDRIA certified consultant and trainer and works with a broad range of clients in her practice. And this is just a brief a certificate of appreciation to Dr. Laila. Uh, signed by myself and Sister Fatima, in appreciation of your time and efforts and in recognition of continue, your continued excellency in the field of Islamic psychology. We will email this to you as well, inshallah. So thank you for all for attending and we're looking forward to listen to Dr. Leila now. Allow me to stop sharing my screen and feel free to take over. The floor is your Dr. Leila and honored to have you with us. Thank you, Dr. Leila. Thank you, Dr. Leila. Thank you, Dr. Leila. Thank you, Dr. Leila. Thank you, Dr. Leila.
most welcome. Jazakallah khair, brother. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Um, Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala Sayyid al mursaleen Allahumma shrak li sadri wa yassar li amri wa hlul uqdatan min lisani yafqahu qawli. I am really honored to be with you today and to share my knowledge and experience. And I'm really excited to learn about all the work that you are doing um, in ISIP, inshallah. And I look forward to uh, learning from all of you and, and, and other colleagues, inshallah. Um, I wanted to begin by asking you how many of you are mental health providers? just to kind of gain an assay of my audience. So if you could contribute in the chat, that would be really helpful. Maybe with yes or no. Feel free to use the chat. Maybe with hands up. How many hands up if you, <laughs> yeah. Perfect, thank you. There's a lot of mental professionals. Maybe people are shy, uh, Dr. Layla. Okay. <laughs> excellent, excellent. Because my my topic was a little more clinical. Um, so I, um, just to share with you that um, I'll be speaking much more from a clinical perspective on the application of Islamic psychology. So for those of you that that is not um, as immediately relevant, inshallah, you'll still be able to um, find something that is helpful for you in the process, inshallah. So for those of you that are practicing, um, do any of you practice Islamic psychology? Anyone? Or in the process of figuring it out, inshallah, okay. So some of you do. Okay, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. So one thing that I think about when I think about Islamic psychology is I think about what does it mean for our clients to be seen by an Islamic psychology practitioner? What are the implications? What would you tell me if you were to describe one in one or two words in the chat, what do they get by seeing an Islamic psychologist? What would you say? What comes to mind? What do they get? They get validated. Okay. What else do, what do they get? They get peace. Uh-huh. Faith-based, connecting to Allah. Uh-huh. Judged. Ooh. Um, someone who understands their worldview, spiritually centered intervention, understanding. Assurance, sharing values, really good points, you guys. And the reason why I'm asking that is actually the reason why I'm speaking about the golden thread, right? And I'll explain to you what I mean by golden thread. Um, because I think a lot of times when we think about Islamic psychology, we think about what interventions we do. You know, some people will say, well, if someone is lonely, prescribe to them reading Surat Maryam, for example, because Sayyidah Maryam was lonely. And so if you do this, then that helps with that. And so we think intervention when we think Islamic psychology, we don't always think about the other aspects of treatment. And that's what I would like to share today. I'd like to talk about, um, I'd like to talk about kind of what the implications are. And this is interesting. Um, one of the participants says it depends on the strand of Islam they follow. So it would depend on whether or not they know who they are and where they would direct you. Interesting concept, right? So in some ways you have a construct and in some ways you follow a construct. Um, and I wanna tell you a little bit about my development as a provider that now says I also employ Islamic psychology in my practice. Um, because I remember when I earned my doctorate, one of my mom's friends said, Alhamdulillah, khalas ya Layla. Now you get to teach everybody about Islam because surely no one who understands Islam will ever have any psychological problem. And I thought, whoa, 
um, what do I do with all of my interventions if the whole time I was supposed to just practice Islam? Why did I get the doctorate, right? Um, and so we find ourselves in this predicament of, are we integrating Islam? Or does Islam carry within it a whole new framework that may or may not be consistent with the idea of Western psychology? But irrespective of what you decide, how you decide to identify your framework, what is important is that our framework is aligned with Islam. Um, I had, alhamdulillah, one experience that really taught me a lot um, was a few years ago, I had a client who, you know, I practiced at a, at a just a regular clinic and a few sessions into seeing me, my client told me, was very tearful and said, I, I'm, I want to share something with you and I hope I don't freak you out. And I said, okay. And she said, um, I've been looking into Islam. This was, you know, an older white woman who, I mean, she'd known about Islam, but she hadn't thought about it before. And alhamdulillah, she went on to become Muslim. Um, but I was very clear with her. I said, you know, I continue to be your therapist and you can, you know, receive your Islamic, you know, guidance information with others in the community. It can't be from me. I am going to continue to do your, your treatment. Um, and after she became Muslim and everything, and I asked, what, what made you curious about Islam? And she said, before you became my therapist, I was seeing another therapist. And she said, you would come out into the waiting room to get your clients. And I saw how you received them. You look genuinely happy to see them. And she said, me and the receptionist would joke about, I want what she's on. And she said, I would compare it to the other providers. And you just seem to really embody something that was even bigger than you. And she said, and I, I became more curious. And she said, I really liked how it seemed that for Muslims, Islam wasn't just something they did one day a week. It really seemed to be a way of life. And I hadn't thought about how we come off, even at that moment, to people that are not even our own clients, right? It's such a heavy responsibility when it's working and when it's not working, right? I mean, we're, we're, our existence is testimony all the time, subhanAllah, to this deen and to the work that we're doing, um, even when we're not doing that work, right? Um, and so I wanted to talk about that. I wanted to talk about, I don't know that we, we talk so much about intervention when we talk about Islamic psychology. How do I intervene? What do I do that's an Islamic intervention? And so today I'm gonna to talk to you about the concept of a golden thread. And I'm, I'm gonna only use three slides because I really want us to kind of get into it. And I would like us to interact with the content and to really think about what it means for us I will be bringing in, um, whenever I can, some examples um, of work that I've done. I do want to assure you, I think sometimes people get nervous about um, when a provider shares something about, you know, I had a client, but I just want you to all know that this is not a breach of confidentiality. It's actually used in teaching a lot, and we de-identify the information that is presented such that you will not be able to trace back um, who the client is. And a lot of times we will change aspects of the information just to blur it even further and to be able to use the situation to teach. So I wanted to assure you of that. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. I will begin with my lecture here. All right, everyone can see my screen clearly, inshallah. All right, and so my topic today is on Islamic psychology, a golden thread through identity, presence, and interventions. This is inshallah what I will be addressing. I'm trying to keep my chat open so I can at least follow what is going on there. All 
All right. And so what is the golden thread? I'm sorry, you guys, I'm having just a little bit of technical difficulties here with this. There we go. So when we talk about the golden thread, um, the golden thread is a metaphorical concept. We use it a lot of times when we're teaching about documentation. So the golden thread is a metaphorical concept that really aims to emphasize clarity and consistency throughout um, the documentation or you know, of a process or throughout the execution of a process. So I'll be talking about the golden thread as it relates to the implementation of Islamic psychology. Um, when we look at the golden thread, we think about clarity, right? Is the message, um, is the message, main message or process clear? Is it consistent? Do I maintain a consistent tone, style? Am I continuing to adhere to the orientation throughout the treatment? Um, is it coherent? Is my process organized? Is it connected? Does it flow? Is what I'm doing relevant? Are my interventions relevant to the client, to their diagnoses, to their presentation, to their presenting problem, to their circumstances, right? Is the process, is engagement um, possible? Is the process conducted with transparency? Is the client allowed to, able to and allowed to interact? And is it reiterated throughout the process? Is, is it clear? Is it reinforced through what I'm doing? And also navigation is important. Can the client and can my colleagues understand the process that ensued? Navigation is interesting because sometimes when I um, work with Islamic psychology providers, they're nervous about how they document what they did. And they worry that it will not, that it's not a clinical intervention. And it absolutely is. And I'd also like to talk about that with you guys, inshallah, um, about how it can be documented. Um, and it's interesting that when we think Islam, unfortunately, a lot of times we think I'm either a clinician or I'm doing Islam. And we don't know how to hold that duality into what we're doing. And it's so incredibly important because when you're a provider who has this training and these expertise, you need to be able to use your knowledge of Islam and you, your knowledge of mental health together to empower the process. Okay. And so when we think about what does it mean for our clients? And I already asked you this question. What does it mean for our clients uh, to receive care from an Islamic psychology practitioner or a provider? Right, what does it mean? What do we aspire to? And you've offered me your questions, and now I want us to think a little deeper about our processes. So I've included, um, I've included our criteria for the golden thread: clarity, consistency, coherence, relevance, engagement, reiteration, and navigation. Right, and so. What I would like to go through is I would like to kind of go through and scrutinize our processes in therapy and to think about how our processes line up with Islamic psychology. Because a lot of times when we say Islamic psychology, people are only thinking about the interventions that they execute rather than all of this. And if we need to take that golden thread through this whole process, what would that process look like? And is it possible to embody Islamic psychology and to be able to do EMDR and to be able to do brain spotting and to be able to do somatic work, right? And to be able to do ACT and to be able to do all kinds of other therapies and how is it possible, right? And this is what I'd really like to get into. So really, we're going to spend the bulk of the time on this slide. 
um, really thinking about scrutinizing our practice and really thinking about what does it mean for us? So we have a responsibility when we think about our clients and our, our therapeutic relationship with our clients. It starts even before the session. What is it, how do our bios address what we do? How do our intake forms address what we do? For those of you that are clinicians, what are the core values that you operate from? What, what core values do you believe in? And so really thinking about front loading, what it means for us to be who we are as providers. What does it mean for my non-Muslim clients to be seen by an, by an Islamic psychology practitioner? Is it possible, and tell me yes or no, what do you think? Is it possible for a non-Muslim client to be seen by an Islamic psychology practitioner and for me to provide them with care without utilizing Islamic, Islamic interventions? What do you think? What do you think? I've got one yes. Yeah. Yes, we absolutely can. We absolutely can. And when I do that, I need not abandon that part of who I am. Right? So it's in our intakes. It's in our intake paperwork. It's in our website. Now thinking about informed consent. What is informed consent? Informed consent, hmm, good question. Someone says, what do you mean by Islamic interventions? Islamic interventions being a lot of times people will think that they think that Islamic interventions are like, do this many tasbih, do, right? You know, or like pulling in Islamic content, overt Islamic content. And so is it possible to do it? Yeah. I will, I don't, um, I've been asked to um, make it a bit easier for those not familiar with academic terminologies. I will do my best. Um, I prepared this presentation really from a clinical perspective. So I will do my best to help the process. Um, yeah, inshallah, I'll do my best, inshallah. So um, as you think about even the concept of informed consent, why do we have our clients conduct, you know, complete informed, you know, why do we explain the informed consent, client bill of rights? Why do we do that? We do that a lot of times from a legal perspective. But what's the Islamic end of why it is important for us to complete that paperwork? Because it is an amana. Consent is very important in Islam. It is very important that people understand the process transparently and understand what they're getting into, for them to understand the rules of therapy, to understand their rights and responsibilities. And to convey this is an amana. It is a responsibility on us as Muslim providers. So we are actually accountable to do that. And Muslims, you know, if you read through the Quran, you'll see how many times Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that we are to um, we are to keep our promises. We are to honor our vows. We are to honor our promises. So I'm, I'm having two interesting questions. Um, how do we process? How do the processes line up with Islamic psychology? Is it possible to embody Islamic psychology and to be able to integrate it with other therapies? How is it possible? Yes, that's inshallah what we're talking about today and is it uh, so uh, dr Laila, so brother rafai is one of our colleagues and he's just summarizing oh, oh he's summarizing it yeah yeah <laughs> jazakallah khair brother <laughs> yes jazakallah khair yeah and um and so and so thinking about 
you know, thinking about not only your niya, but your responsibility Islamically as a Muslim, it is your responsibility to honor your the vows that you have kept when you are an, a licensed provider and your responsibility towards your clients to honor that and make sure that they understand the process that they're getting into, the risks associated with the treatment or whatever you're doing. All right, and then we talk about attitude and communication. You know, it's when we think about our attitude and our communication as a Muslim provider who utilizes Islamic psychology, what do we think about? You know, we think about our akhlaq and our presence. We think about our attire, our reception, our punctuality. And in a time in the world where Islamophobia is very, very high, thinking also about also how, how to honor ourselves and how to stand in our light at the same time. Uh, what, I, what is so beautiful about the seerah of Prophet Muhammad is he's given us so many examples of different ways that we can show up. So many different personalities um, exist among the Sahaba. Some of us are going to be more demure, others are going to be much more direct. Right, but how do we, no matter who we are, be able to still line up with the akhlaq that we are supposed to embody? And when we receive our clients, a lot of us are doing telehealth, but when we receive our clients, um, thinking about our attire, thinking about our reception, thinking about our punctuality, it is an Islamic value to be punctual. We are, after all, the ummah that prays five times a day. Yet we joke about Arab time, Daisy time, right? We joke about our timeliness being, you know, not on time. And I don't agree. I don't think that we are not a punctual people, but I think that the way in which we show up sometimes is different from the clock. A lot of how we show up is with our prayers. You know, you sometimes will meet with your friend at noon and sometimes you meet with your friend after Lohor, right? But understanding the contract that we have with our clients and with our work, it's really important to not only hold our clients accountable to that punctuality, but hold ourselves up to that. And that is an Islamic value as well. Do we smile to our clients? And also when we think about the process of being a mental health provider, a lot of times people talk about providers as being healers, right? And it's really important for us to think about and to be mindful of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the healer. And what are we? If Allah is the healer, what are we? You know, sometimes my clients will tell me, you know, I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to just heal me, heal me, right? Send me something. Most of the time, when you are praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, so much of the goodness that he sends our way, he sends through people. Goodness is sent through people, just like pain is a lot of times transmitted to us through people. So our existence is an intra-connected existence, right? We have mirror neurons in our brain. And some theories indicate that 60% of our mirror neurons will attune to the person that we are with. Allahu Akbar, right? So that presence of being with one another is so incredibly impactful. And do we stop and do we connect? And are we able to be humble with the opportunity to do I think some of the most important work. Sometimes people will say to me, Dr. Leila, do you think that we should all be studying psychology because our Oma needs it? No, I actually don't. 
I actually don't. I don't think that people should be doing this work if they don't have a giftedness or a very strong interest in it. Because we want people to do that which they will do best. You are more likely going to succeed in life if you take that which you are good at and improve it, rather than try to take that which you're not good at and make yourself good at it, right? Work with your giftedness. And so thinking of ourselves as healers, think of our, I think of us as more facilitators of a process. And we have a responsibility. And when we talk about Islamic psychology, that's a very big concept. But I think one of the main things of being an Islamic psychologist is my humility to the process of healing. And that I, I am not a healer. I'm someone who, alhamdulillah, one of the blessings that Allah has given me and that he holds me accountable to is what I do with what I have been given. Right? That amana that I have. Even completing client notes is an amana. Collaborative care is an amana. Smiling, you know, receiving clients. When I set up my practice, I was thinking about how I wanted to, how I wanted to design my, um, my lobby. And one thing that I had noticed was that a lot of times in our communities, people feel so unseen when they're receiving public aid. And a lot of times they feel that they're treated as if they have no goodness in their, in the countries that they come from. And I noticed when I worked in community mental health that my immigrant clients were most upset by messy or like old or raggedy um, spaces. It, it was almost offensive, it hurt um, because it reinforced that it disconnected from everything that they knew. So one of the first things that I did, I said, I want to make the lobby and the offices, um, I want them to feel like a home. I want them, I wanna have coffee and I wanna have tea and I want my clients to be the guests. And I want them to feel seen and accepted and honored and welcome. Right? That intention was placed so that this space would be the best. My clinic doesn't, its name is not anything Islamically related, but the presence and the flavor and the quality absolutely is inshallah. That's definitely the intention. And even one of the things that I think about is even the clinic that I have founded I truly believe is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's, right? And it's an amana that I've been entrusted with. And the moment I fail it, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will take it from me. Because he did not give this to me just to have, right? He gave it to me to do something with it, right? So it's, it's an amana, it's a responsibility. Something that I've been entrusted with. A lot of times when we think about that very first session with our clients, there's a concept called strength-based interviewing, right? So the client comes in, they filled out their intake paperwork, and you ask your client, what brings you in today? We don't really talk a lot about spirituality in the West, I mean, kind of, definitely not religiosity. But even when we talk about spirituality, 
It's just kind of like identification of spirituality. But I think that there's so much more room for us to address spirituality, to think about the questions we're asking people. So I've written down a few questions to share with you just to kind of think about them together. When I work with my Muslim clients, I ask them about how they identify their deen. You know, what, where they're at with that, right? And sometimes it's very important to them and other times they say, I am not interested in it. Um, and then I say, okay, can you tell me more about that? And when I'm asking more about that, it's not because I am trying to give them dawah. It's because I'm trying to give them treatment. And because a lot of times, and here's why Islamic psychology is so important. Remember when I told you about that client, what she said? I noticed that Islam is in everything that you guys do. For Muslims, even when someone is not religious, it's still a way of life because the hurt of not being able to hold on to it permeates through your whole life. It bugs you in so many aspects of who you are. So it's actually really important when working with Muslims to be able to talk about this. With converts, I ask about, don't ask necessarily about the story of how they became Muslim because a lot of times convert stories and how they became Muslim is really sensationalized. And it's almost, um, it's almost a kink that people just kind of want to hear these stories. It makes them excited. And I think, I think that in a time where Islamophobia is so high, I think for born Muslims, it kind of blows us away how somebody who has so many freedoms on the outside would choose this of all things. They must be an angel, right? So we go from overvaluing converts to completely devaluing them when they don't behave the way that we expect them to behave. One of the things I work with, with converts, so, I mean, functionally, I'm pretty much a trauma psychologist at this point. One of the things I work with with converts is really exploring with them parts of them that maybe hold more doubt or hold more grief. Whenever you take something on, you lose something else. And there's a process to that grief. A lot of people have lost family, have lost friends, have lost a lifestyle. And it's important to account for that. Parts of self, right? And I think that understanding a lot of this when we do our history taking is so essential. Um, do we ask our clients if they have a favorite ayah, if they have a favorite companion of the Prophet وسلم, when in their lives they most felt uh, Allah's presence with them? Um, what their hardest ibadah is and what the easiest ibadah for them is and what they do when they struggle. And a lot of times, unfortunately, post-COVID, I think that a lot of times people struggle with nurturance because Islam is taken on as kind of, unfortunately, a whip that we tell people whether they're doing the right thing or the wrong thing, rather than a source of light and compassion. Prophet Muhammad وسلم, said, Ma kana fi shayin illa zana. Right? Kindness did not enter into anything without beautifying it. Right? So where is the kindness? Where is the gentleness? This is the way of our deen. Another hadith that says, Al-mu'minu mir'ati akhi. The believer is the mirror of the believer. There's a concept in 
early psychological interventions that we learn in graduate school called mirroring. Hmm, look at that. And we have we're mirrors for one another. But when I look at the mirror, the mirror doesn't say, ooh, you're bad. I can't believe you did that. Right? The mirror says, hmm, your hair's showing. And then what I decide to do with it, I do with it, right? So as providers, we mirror our clients. It's a, it's, um, it's a juxtaposition, it's a mirror image of how they're showing up. It's a presence with them. So a lot of our history taking um, needs to align with that. I noticed that a lot of people, re providers and clients in our communities really, really struggle with issues of Biral Walidain, like really, really have a hard time with that. Um, honoring our parents or listening to our parents is really, really hard for them. It sounds, you know, it seems to me that one part of the parent-child contract is more honored than the other. So the part of honoring our parents is more highlighted oftentimes, and the other half of it is missing. If I went to the bank and I deposited money, I would be able to, um, I'd be able to withdraw it. And I think of the parent-child relationship in a very similar way. Parents give care, they give re'aya, they give, they take care of their children. And inshallah, when the parent is older, then they withdraw. Sometimes when I talk with parents of teens, they say, where is Birra and They tell me often. Teenagers tell you often that's normal teenage behavior, right? They're still wrestling with their potency in the world. They're not grown adults yet. They're not grown adults. They're supposed to. They're checking their, their might and their power. And they're practicing with the safest person in their world. They're practicing with you. You're the parent. Right? And so we still need to teach them the akhlaq of how to do that, the manners of how to do that. But alhamdulillah, right? We're raising a child that, that has fire in their belly and they truly believe that they're right. right. So we just need to soften those edges. Right? And sometimes, a lot of times Muslims, when they go to see non-Muslim providers, the non-Muslim providers talk to them about boundaries. And there's a very heavy cancel culture going on in the world right now. And this is a very individualistic way of being in the world. Like that hurts me. That's a lot of negative energy. I'm just going to not engage with that, right? And but qata al arham and anyone who facilitates the severing of womb bonds or family bonds is actually in trouble. By Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's not okay to do that. And so what, do, what implication does that have for us? You know, and how do we, how do we talk about that? And even the fact that they're called silat rahim, it's a connection of the womb, is really striking. It's a connection of the womb. Like, and the womb comes from the root word of rahma, mercy. This doesn't mean that every parent is going to be merciful. There are parents that not only don't care for their children, they hurt them. That is a violation of the covenant with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Our children come from us biologically, but they do not belong to us. Their souls belong to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and we have been entrusted with them. And to violate them is to violate a covenant with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What do we do with that? And there are times where honoring our parents is a sadaqah. It's not maybe a right that they have, but it's a sadaqah. It's a charity that we give. And that's okay too, because sometimes that's a reality. I 
I have some questions that are coming through and I'm trying to address some of them. Just trying to see how to. You want Dr. Layla, we could go through them afterwards if you feel it's okay, easier. Okay, we can go through them afterwards because Lenny, I'm struggling to understand um, a little bit about your question. So inshallah, we'll be able to address it um, after. Another thing that, um, that I think about when we think about our case conceptualizations of our clients. Um, before I get to actually to case conceptualization, I wanna talk a little bit about more about trauma history. I think it's really, really important, especially as a Muslim provider, to not make meaning for people of their experiences. Um, being an Islamic provider does absolutely not mean that you suddenly violate your client's right to autonomy, to um, being honored and received. Right, these are, there are values. Um, these are personal values, so it's very important. So if a client says to me, um, I had one client early in my career who we were talking about um, Islam for her and she said, it's a source of pain for me. Um, I used to get whipped every time it was time for salah and I absolutely dislike it. Now, Religious trauma is real because religion is so incredibly powerful. And just like light, just like the energy of light, it can give light and also it can burn things. And so you have to be very careful. We have to be very careful with dosing and placement and appropriateness of things. You know, even Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that if you are harsh and hard-hearted, people will be dissuaded from you. And this is Rasulullah, right? So when a client comes and tells me this happened, I am not in a position to tell my client, that's okay, your parents wanted the best for you. Or she shouldn't have done that, Right? I still am present as a provider and I still say, I'm really sorry that happened to you. Can you tell me how you wish it would have been? And then my client telling me how they wish they would have been drawn to Salah is actually really powerful. Right? So I'm not telling them this is what it is and this is how it should be. I want to hear from them. I want to hear from them. I want to understand from them. And another really, really important thing when working with our clients is husn al -dhan. Giving the benefit of doubt. Thinking the best of our clients. And one of the greatest violations of husn al -dhan is that we don't always assume that our clients want to get better. Something so simple. Nobody, nobody, nobody wants to wake up and suffer. No one. In fact, they are coming to see us because they want the pain to go away. Because they want the suffering to go away. And so we have to, it is their right that we give them husn of fun to assume the best of them. It's not enough to know better. Sometimes we need a process to help us do better. A lot of times by the time people have come to us, they've tried a lot of things. And they're at that point where they don't know. They don't know how they can deal with that anxiety. They don't know what they're going to do with those flashbacks. 
they don't know if they can stay in that college. They don't know if they can stay in that marriage. If I assume that the person in front of me is lazy, I will not honor them and respect them. But if I give them husn of bun, I think the best of them. And if I think that every client that comes my way was actually sent to me from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then I am going to practice with a lot more respect. Because every client that we get, Muslim or not Muslim, is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One of the dots that's important for us to make is, Ya Allah, send me clients that I can help. Send me people I can help, that I will be effective with, that I can learn through. Because even doing this work and doing it well is a responsibility. We need to continue to advance our learning. We need to continue to step up, right? Doing what we do, doing how we do it. When I worked at the Community Mental Health Center, one day I had a woman talk to me on the phone. We had a lovely conversation. And when she came to the clinic, she looked at me and she said, oh no, 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 no. And I said, yeah. And she goes, it's you, huh? And I said, yeah. And she said, I don't know if I feel comfortable. And I said, well, how about we go back to my office and we talk about it? So we sat in my office and, and I said, she said, I, and she's shaking, her legs are trembling. And she said, I don't know how I feel about working with people like you. And I said, yeah, it does look like you're pretty shocked. And she said, yeah, I am. And, um, and I said, well, um, when I read your notes, it looked like you had a pretty extensive trauma history. And among my colleagues, I have a lot of trauma training. And so I think that's why you were sent my way. And I said, but if you would like to, you know, be referred to any of my colleagues, I'm, you know, I'd be happy to facilitate that referral. She sighed and she said, well, I've waited a long time for this appointment. Um, I don't know, just talk, tell me about you. I said, hmm, well, let's see. I've been a provider for blah, blah, blah. I, um, I have training and blah, 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 right? It was actually blah, 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 right? And then I said, and I'm a mom of three kids and I also have X amount of cats. And she looked at me and she said, you have cats? I said, yeah. She goes, I love cats. And we talked about cats and she agreed to see me. I had a very full caseload. So I would have actually been happy to refer her. But Alhamdulillah, you know, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says that Allah, um, Allah prefers the believer that is strong. As clinicians, the more skilled we are at what we do, that is strength. And it uplifts our deen. It uplifts our clients. It uplifts the work that we do. When I shared that incident with my non-Muslim um, colleagues, they were really upset that she challenged me. But we're Muslims. We are challenged all the time, right? We are al Guraba. We we know that we will always um, we will always be the outliers, and that's okay for us, right? So she continued to be my clients, and um, you know we continued to do good work. On the very last session, she talked to me about her first session, which I think was really good for the both of us to kind of have that process. And so when we think about how we talk about the work that we do with the clients that we have, how we talk about why people do what they do, 
um, and how important it is to have that husnal van. I, um, so I practiced for eight and a half years in Dubai, and I was really surprised when I went to Dubai because it is a country full of Muslims, and that is extremely impacted by West, the West and Western practices. And a lot of people assumed that I was less competent than my colleagues because of my hijab. I was really surprised because I kind of had this idea that I'm going to a Muslim country, but going to a country with Muslims is very different than a Muslim country, right? And so I was surprised at how much psychoeducation I had to do on the process of mental health. I had, um, I'm gonna kind of buffer this story and kind of change some elements to it. There was one day where I had a colleague that held my client by her abaya, just kind of like did this and directed her towards me. He was a psychiatrist and he said to me, Dr. Leila, I have no treatment for this. I have nothing to say. Um, please help her because I have no medication I can give her. And um, I said, yeah, well, come in, come in. And she sat down and she covered her face and she said, oh no, you're a muhajaba. She was saying it in a very different way because the reason why she was she had come to see him was because she had cheated on her husband with many, many men. She didn't know how to stop. So she had gone to my colleague. My colleague had told her, you have a daughter. This is going to happen to your daughter. How do you do this? What kind of a person are you? Right? Remember what we said about Hasna Van. Did she want to get better? Of course she wanted to get better. That's why she was there. Right? She was there because she wanted to do better. And so when we talked about it, we ended up doing trauma work. Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لا يزر وزرة وزرة أخرى. No one is punished by the actions of another. So this concept of bad things are going to happen to her daughter because she's doing bad things, that's culture. That's culture. That's not Allah. Right? Was, was my client motivated to change? Yes. When I did trauma work with my client, it became apparent that she was actually dissociating. She had very little recollection of those encounters. Alhamdulillah, it stopped. Did a lot of trauma work with her. We did a lot of EMDR. Her life was plagued with sexual assault after sexual assault. Sometimes that makes people avoid those things. And sometimes that makes people engage more in those things. I am not there to judge her. I am there to help her. And that's exactly what I did. And alhamdulillah. But that wouldn't be possible to do that work if I was assuming that she's someone who just had no control over herself. Did she not know how to stand in front of the mirror and tell herself, control yourself? She couldn't control it. There was no desire. She wasn't feeling anything pleasurable. She could barely remember the experience and she was dissociating. In the process of trying to heal herself, she had been trying for eight years. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave her sitr because her husband never found out. She was engaged in all of this and Allah concealed it for her. That is a gift that she got. 
she was able to close this chapter of her life. And she had full sitter. She had full concealment. Alhamdulillah. But she was still an honorable human being. In the process of trying to heal herself, she had memorized six juzu of the Quran. She had attended halaqas galore. She had put on niqab, taken off niqab, put on niqab, taken off niqab, tried everything. But it's like there was a switch. She slept with the man that installed her, her drapes for her. It's like there was a switch, there was trauma, you know, playing into it. But once we treated the trauma, it went away. You know, some people say to me, oh, so what are you saying? I'm not saying anything. I'm not saying anything. I'm not saying people are responsible or people are not responsible. That's not my judgment. That's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's judgment. I am saying it is my responsibility to do the best I can with the skills that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed me to have learned. And I do it to the best that I can. And sometimes I look at things and I say, subhanAllah, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa said, وَجَعَلْنَا, وَجَعَلْنَا لِكُلِّ دَاءٍ دَوَاءٍ we've, we've created for every ailment a treatment. And so there is so much healing out there. What are we doing to access it? What are we doing to connect that knowledge? And how do we do our treatment planning accordingly? And how do we talk about our discharge planning? The goals can involve something related to their spirituality. And it can involve removing barriers that are getting in the way. The first deity that we worship is our parents. The first deity in life that we worship is our parents. Our parents transfer our obudiya, our worship from them to Allah. We first, our first understanding of God is our parents. They are everything for us, right? But then our parents are the ones that introduce the concept of God and religion, right? So many times, if our parents have the harshness, they transfer our understanding of Allah as being full of harshness. And that is so scary. Scary for the child and scary for, scary for the akhirah of the parents. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala repeatedly calls himself Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. And the only thing that we pass on to our children is fright. Some people are motivated by fear and others are deterred by it. I feel like I'm close to my time. How am I doing on time? Jazakallah khairan, Dr. Layla. I think, yeah. yeah. I, mean, I speak for all of the participants. It's been a very uh, engaging uh, lecture in many ways. Let's just give you a round of applause for a beautiful okay. uh, exposure of ways that we can think as clinicians when it comes to applying, uh, you know, Islamic psychology, uh, in our clinical practice. Let me just ask all of our members to give a round of digital applause so so that we can uh, really send our appreciations. Barakallah uh, Dr. Leila, it was very, very thorough. I'm a clinician myself. I'm also trained in Islamic psychology. I have ijazan, traditionally Islamically integrated psychotherapy. Uh, so I do work with that. And I do recognize and uh, I do relate to a lot of the things you said. One thing that really caught my eye was, or many things, but one is when we are trained in mainstream psychology, which is unfortunately the Western paradigm today. I mean, we would like mainstream psychology to be a multiplex psychology that allows all types of indigenous psychology to be part of the mainstream, right? 
And inshallah, with the works that we're doing, all of us doing together, what you're doing in the York Center, what we're trying to do as ISIP, international movement, is to bring that about, right? But it might take some time, but we have positive psychology. You mentioned ACT, acceptance and commitment therapy, which is part of the third wave CBT. Though, inshallah, we will have more opportunities to normalize. Nevertheless, um, you're trained sometimes to be very non-personal with your client and the mainstream paradigm, you know, not to show... Uh, you know, the heart-to-heart -heart connection, or as we call it, the murabata, the heart-to-heart -heart linking, you know. And when I was trained in Islamic psychology and also through all of our works within ISIP and all of our affiliated initiatives, we just learned that this is not the Islamic paradigm at all, you know. And in the beginning, you're like, am I professional? Am I not professional? Uh, wait a minute. Am I, like, crossing any boundaries between the relationship between, you know, uh, therapist and client? And then you mentioned also, like, the mirror, Right. And you even gave it a neuro a biological, you know, um, reflection of you know the mirror and uh, neurons that we have, which is actually a way of us to reflect from one another, which is part of our biological disposition that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala has you know created within us. Uh, and then you start to deconstruct your way of looking at your role as a therapist, uh, and you start to understand that it's not about being professional in the sense of being cold or being like on a higher level, it's almost like mainstream psychology is giving the role of therapist a very nafsani element of, I am the professional, I can't show you who I am. I am here, I'm not gonna show anything. It's almost like being a clean slate of sheet, which is not human. And then when you connect with people through murabata, through, for instance, as also Imam Ghazali rahimullah speaks, to be a sound companion of your friend, you know, if you don't find a, 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 a pious uh, sheikh then find a sound companion to mirror you and that's perhaps what our role as you know clinician could be to be that sound companion it's actually a healing journey not only for the client but also for the therapist <laughs> in all honesty and it takes time you know to re uh, deconstruct your ways of being trained you know and i think i speak for a lot of mental professionals a lot of our colleagues who have felt the same you know almost like anxiety that goes into relief after you deconstruct your role, you know, and you bring a more human aspect. So thank you so much for that reminder, Dr. Leila. It really caught my heart and my eye, you know, and I really believe that the modality that we have as, uh, as, as students of Islamic psychology, as seekers of knowledge, as practitioners, as scholars, as whatever, you know, uh, role we have as parents, as brothers and sisters, is to bring that humanness into the relationship. And as you say, we're not the healers. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the healer. He's the al-shafi. We're just the vessels, and that's it. And that's also something very unique for our you know, position compared to mainstream psychology. And also, unfortunately, some of the new age movements, with, for lack of better words, that are bringing in some spirituality, but it's very secularized versions of spirituality, uh, mm -hmm. they portray themselves as the healers. And sometimes we have even seen in some Muslim communities that that type of terminology, and I have personal dawn for my brothers and sisters, by the way, subconsciously has been internalized. I don't think people are doing it intentionally, honestly. Uh, and we also see that even some of our tradition in Islamic psychology is now being secularized into the new age movements and even some aspects of positive psychology where they take the, for instance, aspects of tasabuf, but they deconnect it from sharia, for instance, or detach it from the holistic yeah. aspect. Of yeah. And that's something that I think, instead of blaming others, we should take responsibility of us as Muslims introducing that, right? Because then you have like, okay, we're doing spirituality, but then I'm the healer, and I'm using poetry from the tasabuf tradition, or from our akhlaq tradition, or but they didn't, never want to adhere it to fiqh, and to Sharia, you know, so it's like, you know, you can reach like the truth without Sharia either. It's like a connection, interconnection. Then. So I, uh, just to summarize my reflection from your beautiful presentation uh, and a reminder for myself, first and foremost, is to is to have husna done towards others and particularly towards our clients, because we're not better than our clients. You know, <laughs> we're a mirror of them. We have all of their shortcomings in art. We're like, <laughs> we're not better than them. That's one. The second is that even what we're seeing in, in the aspect of some people calling themselves healer, let's try to show them that that's not the case, first by education, but also to understand the societal paradigm, which is that we live in a modern society that is anthropocentric. It's human-centric. So the therapist is the new 
preacher. The therapist is for lack of spiritual guidance, specifically in the Western Hemisphere. The therapist is the new preacher. It's the solution. He or she is the, has the solution for everything, which is, of course, not true, right? So these are just some of the reflection, Dr. Leila. I want yeah, to thank you so much for a beautiful lecture. Jazakallah had beautiful reflections. It makes me think about even um, how even the concept of tell me everything is actually, um, it comes from confession. Yeah. Um, you, if you, if you are, if you are afflicted, you know, you don't have to, you know, conceal it. You don't have to, um, divulge, um, the details of, of your struggle, um, mm. you know, in order to heal. And so even that concept of tell me everything is, is absolutely not necessary. Mm, I agree. Barakalafika, Dr. Leda, amazing lecture. We're so honored to learn from your vast amount of knowledge. There are a couple of questions. And brothers and sisters, we have about 10 minutes left. We're also mindful of Dr. Leila's time. She woke up very early. You're in the central time, uh, you know, North America. So we want to, uh, you know, honor your time. Uh, Lenny has asked, uh, and brothers and sisters, please ask your questions in the chat. We will not be able to open up the microphone due to organizational, uh, you know, issues it's not easy to facilitate when we're so members like i saw some people having their hands up so please add your questions in the chat it's easier to organize this smoothly thank you so much for understanding please forgive us for any shortcomings brothers and sisters so lenny is asking our community name is belajar jadi ibu or how to become a mom in islamic perspective and bringing up the topic based on hype cases in indonesia right now which is about mental health issues and associated with tawheed do you have any reference or input for us how to develop and elaborate the, the issue? I don't understand the question. Do you understand the question, Dr. Leila? Uh, Lenny, could you please in the chat explain the question a little bit, uh, you know, perhaps re rephrase it or something. We're happy to address it to Dr. Leila, inshallah. Uh, so let's see here. Uh, Sister Zainab is writing, the concept of boundary does not necessarily translate to severing of ties, though, does it? I remember a Muslim client of mine who was very distressed because she wanted to be away from her parents for different reasons. Being with the parents was making her very negative towards Islam as well because they would force all their demands on her and guilt trip in the name of religion. I am wondering then if differentiating from the family would be the way in the sense of a healthy distance. I completely agree with you. Having boundaries is not qat al arham. Canceling people, cutting them off completely is qat al arham. And so one of the things that sometimes I talk with clients about is like, what connection can you have without compromising your well-being and your emotional safety? You know, sometimes it's like, I'll send them a card or, you know, I'll visit them on whatever, you know, whatever is possible. So not thinking about everything that you're going to cut, but really thinking about what level of engagement can I have that doesn't compromise my well-being. Jazakallah Dr. Leila, for a great, uh, great answer. MB11 is asking, as a response to Rafai Muhammad, uh, our beloved, by the way, Brother Rafai, beautiful summary, summary of uh, Dr. Leila's lecture. A uh, very useful comment, uh, Jazakallah Khairan. What if it's necessary to give meaning to clients' experiences in the form of structure explanation of what happened to them and what they are going through? Because that may help the client to get some closure and then they can be guided as how to deal with it once they can see and understand their trauma. That would mean that I am in some way trained to tell them the how and why of what happened to them. That's assuming a lot of expertise on our part. I can explore it with them. I can kind of enter them into a wonderment of like, hmm, I wonder what, you know, but I think that giving them a structured explanation that's that's huge. Um, that's a huge. Um, that's a that's a lot of power that I would be assuming on my part. I don't feel comfortable doing that. And you were assuming through that that just knowing is healing. And I don't think that that um, you know we we hurt through um, experiences. And at the same time, we are capable of healing through experiences, through relationships. And so thinking about 
um, centering our care in a relationship is really, really important. Um, and in beholding that um, connectedness and that collaboration is so essential to the process. Just gonna connect my charger one second. Oh, take your time. Thank you. You can read the it. next question. Yeah, so I just, it was a great question and thank you for your answer. Uh, I was thinking from the aspect of the Laila, why are you charging your computer, uh, you yes. know, to for, through our trials and tribulations, you know, like um, to, for the client, for the practitioner to explain or to help, honestly, to help the client to find the meaning rather than we explaining uh, I'm guessing that it could be something from that point of view that also MB11. By the way, MB11, that's a great uh, name. Well, uh, you know, write your name in the chat. I don't know who MB11. <laughs> Maybe that's your, you know, uh, you know, um, pseudonym. Um, nevertheless, uh, to find meaning, perhaps by helping the client to find the meaning and process that, perhaps could be a good way. Jazakallah Dr. Leila. Uh, we are mindful of your time. We'll take uh, two more questions. Uh, Sister Nadia, uh, one of our excellent colleagues, is also asking, how important do you believe cultivating sound spiritual practice help Islamic psychologists to help their clients? That's a good question, actually. All the questions are good. Like the, own, like the practitioner's own spiritual practice, how beneficial will that be in order to help the client? Um, I think one thing that we have to be really careful about is Shaitan telling us that we have to be perfect. Yeah. Yeah. And we have to remember that it's a process, right? It's a process. We sometimes are able to do more and able to do less. But I think thinking about our um, our value system is really important. And I can hold Islam conceptually. I can hold Islam in a set of values. For my nafs, for my tazkiya, it's important to do practices that continue to polish and improve myself and keep my ego, my nafs at bay. Um, I think that's that's very important. Marshallah, I agree. And honestly, it's kind of like, just as an asiyah to, to myself and also perhaps share experience, like take pause between every client, you know, don't work like one client after a time because you need to really process that because all clients might evoke things in you. So one practice is to actually debrief and just take time, you know, and uh, essentially also, as uh, Dr. Leila said, we're not perfect as Muslims, we're not striving for perfection, but perhaps through also understanding our own shortcomings through our test kit and apps, it allows us to be human with our clients and show that compassion of us that Dr. Leila was speaking about. Jazakallah khair, Dr. Leila, for your uh, excellent explanation. Last question, and then we'll let you go, uh, Dr. Leila. Jazakallah khairan, Dr. Leila. This is for Sister Aya, one of our excellent colleagues as well. I heard you mention the word parts. I'm wondering if you use internal family system therapy in your practice. Would you please share uh, or could you share any Islamic integrated resources for uh, Islam internal family system therapy? I do not use internal family systems. Internal, internal family systems refers to parts uh, in a metaphorical sense. I actually use something called the AIR network, uh, um, the adaptive internal relational model. So you could just kind of search AIR network model. And that is actually what they have found is that when it, it's more of a neurological understanding of parts and subhanAllah, um, when someone is activated, um, it's not even a fully dissociative state. So when someone is activated, what they found is that if they do imaging on the brain, um, let's say a four-year-old part is, uh, you know, they're, they're, something from their childhood is activated. What they found is that the parts of the brain that would not have been mature do not tend to have blood flow. And so it's very much looking at it from a neurophysiological way. And then your interventions are also connected in that way. And when I've worked with um, some converts, um, one of the things that we've worked on is how, how to internally connect Islam with all of those parts. Um, I really like for converts to keep their pre-Islam um, pre names because it's so important to have that gentleness with all of our all of who we are. Um, and to, you know, the golden thread to weave that, weave Islam into um, different parts of us. Because subhanAllah there, you know, Iman is not a, a single construct. It's, it's, um, it's full of waves. 
um, and tides. And so we need to be very gentle um, when we ride those. Jazakallah dear Dr. Leila. This will be our last question for you, even though there are more questions. Inshallah, we will invite you in the future to be with us in our sohbah and companionship. Rounds of applause to Dr. Leila for taking your time. It was an honor to listen to you. It was very fruitful and also very needed for many of us to hear from a clinical pr uh, practice, because we have a lot of theor theoretical lectures in ISIP, uh, and a lot of our uh, members are asking more for application as well to combine the theory, and you did it in such excellent way. Thank you so much. Rounds of digital applause to uh, our excellent Ustada, Dr. Leila. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant you tawfiq in all of your work, both uh, with your clinical work and also research work, inshallah. Yeah, so yeah, thank you so much. Round of applause. And uh, by the way, Dr. Leila, uh, I know it was only three slides, but if you could uh, send them to me, we will share it. With, uh, I could send them to you. Um, uh, brother, would you, um, some people are acting, asking for my contact information. Um, we will, so if you just give me all the, all those yeah, yeah. Are we will email out all the resources you would like to share. We will email so to all the people. You always do I'm that. Yeah. Teaching an EMDR course. Um, with more international um, timing. So if anyone is interested, please reach out and I will be happy to give you a discount code, inshallah. Thank you so much. So just share, uh, for instance, information you mean in the EMDR, how they can register and we will oh. email it. Inshallah. And also, so dear brothers and sisters, you will get all the resources, PowerPoint slides, uh, contact details, and also a future EMDR course and other things from Dr. Leila through email. So register yourself, all of you who joined the lecture today. If you haven't registered yourself in the registration link, Brother Rafai, could you just share the registration link or Sister Kalfa, please register yourself because if not, you will not be able to receive all these resources. Uh, we will email it out uh, as soon as the lecture is uploaded together with the, uh, with the lecture link, inshallah. Dr. Leila, thank you so much. Uh, we're very honored. We will email you your certificate as well. Any last things you want to say before we end? It's been a pleasure and an honor. And I look forward to, I'm also going to be signing up. I would love to continue to be part of this process, inshallah. Uh, we're honored to have you with us, inshallah. So we're looking forward to work with you and we will have more meetings with you to, to tell you more about our movement and we would love to learn more about your excellent work, inshallah. Thank you so much for honoring us and I wish you a great continuation of the day, inshallah. We'll be in touch. Thank you so much. Round of applause again, brothers and sisters. Thank you, Dr. Leila. Jazakallah khairan, brothers and sisters. Um, I want to thank my colleagues, Sister Fatima Ahmed, Sister Kawthar Al-Mernisi, uh, Sister Nadia Niazi, Brother Rafai Muhammad, uh, Sister Nadira, uh, Brother Abdulaziz, uh, Sister Aya, and the rest of our excellent team for all of your efforts, for all of your works. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept your khidmah and good deeds, inshallah. Uh, this movement is nothing without your participation. So brothers and sisters who are joining us today, thank you so much for your engagement, for all of your questions, for all of your reflections. Uh, and in, in two weeks, we will have another lecture uh, let me just see who's the lecture in two weeks. So the last Saturday of the month will be now uh, next. It will be about addiction, Islam and family life with Sister Abida Ahmed from UK. Very interesting lecture. So stay tuned. Uh, please be part of our WhatsApp groups where you can see where the lecture will be uh, and join our newsletter. Become a member by joining our website at isip.foundation. Uh, and that's the next lecture. Uh, and we will email out all the resources from Dr. Leila as soon as possible, inshallah, including her program in the future in EMDR and other things. And we just want to thank you guys. Honestly, all of your engagement is so fruitful. We learned so much from you. You are all teachers as well. We're all collectively learning from each other. And this the whole concept of halaqa and the, uh, and the whole notion of circle and learning from the circle. Uh, by the way, uh, please join the crisis support group so we can support our beloved brothers and sisters in, in Morocco right now. We know that more natural disasters will come. So we're trying to find a way to support and have a group of people supporting every time something happens. Last year was in Pakistan with the flooding. And then we had Turkey with the earthquakes in North Syria. Uh, a couple of years ago, we had uh, earthquakes in Iran. So there is things all the time in the Muslim world. So we need to be you know, organized together so that we can really utilize uh, our you know, strengths and supporting. And it could be with aid, but also with mental health support, honestly, that's very beneficial. So add yourself to the crisis support group uh, and yeah, join our WhatsApp groups and also our YouTube channel. And if you have any questions, you can always reach out to us. Uh, if you want to establish a local chapter in your region, for instance, we're at your service. 
um, and yeah, continue being engaged, brothers and sisters. This is the blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I always tell my colleagues and myself, Allah has gained, given us Zoom and WhatsApp and all these things that we can connect. And this is the movement, right? So you're not alone. We're together. Sometimes we're in your workplace. We feel alone. Nobody understands. I'm trying to normalize this perspective from Islamic. And then you come here, you get the breath for fresh air. You re-energize the battery so you can go back to the field, inshallah. So you always have colleagues and you guys are amazing. So we're very grateful. And please forgive me for any shortcomings, brothers and sisters, from my side. If I hosted in anything wrong, did anything wrong, said anything wrong, please forgive me. And all the good comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and all the shortcomings are mine. Barakallah fikum, everybody. Barakallah fikum, everybody. Barakallah fikum.